Hi, how's it going, guys? It's Resident of Conlon back with another read of all for it to be done. Be gone. Book three, chapter seven Accusations of Apparitions. Okay, so I don't, I don't want to mess this up. Sebastian floated lifelessly in the deep ocean. His face was pale and had tiny little bubbles around his nostrils and lips. His hair sway with the undercurrent of the sea a tiny little silver fish swirled around his body as if he were a fresh new coral they wanted to explore the greens and blues of the ocean water deeper into a darkness the further sebastian's body sank his body turned colder and colder on the surface alice stepped on to shore her Bow now back it body back now to its human form, her clothes heavy with the sea in which stitch of her dress she felt heavy, so heavy as she dragged herself slowly up the sandy beach, dragging her long dress train be behind her. She smiled as the moon sang its glorious co cool color over her mocha skin. He was gone. She had done it, and perhaps saved all who lived on the island from a disastrous end by the vampire, the monster, the creature of the night, Sebastian Lord. Back in the sea, as Alice's power slowly became weaker over Sebastian, his eyes snapped open. He was alive. He saw how far he had sank. The cold ocean water was truly beginning to turn his blood to ice. He moved, but felt no movement. He couldn't breathe. He felt the strength of death coming into his body. Tighter and tighter, the vice of the reaper latched onto Sebastian's throat. He lowered his arms, began to move his legs back and forth in the water, and in seconds began to move up towards the surface. Closer and closer and closer, till he got, he got the light started to peek towards his cold, pale face. And then he broke through. The relief of air to his lungs was instant. He bubbled up and he, or sorry, he bobbed up and down in the ocean. He could see the light of the shore sparkling in the near distance. He floated there, breathing in and out, in and out, in and out. He swam to shore towards the tinkle of village lights and followed the sound of the foghorns of the boats docking on shore. Then he got to shore, his strength waning. He made it to the edge of the western ridge of Terrible Forest. He was soaking wet, cold, and angry. As he walked through the dark forest, guided by the light of the full moon, Sebastian began to feel as if he were watched. He stopped in the center of an open area that was encircled by a large pine trees. He felt safe in open areas, even in the dark. The fog, the very thicket, Welshport fog, rolled over the ground at his knees. He looked to his feet as a sound came from the trees. Then to his right, more sound. It was two people watching, then another, three people. But then in the darkness in all directions, he saw the glowing of three pairs of, eye, of red eyes and low growls of angry wolf bellies. The wolves howled in the night and revealed themselves to Sebastian. They snarled at him, desperate for his flesh. They began to circle him like sharks in the water. He watched them, each timing their attack in their mind, each ready to pounce on his young body to eat from growls more snarls each wolf more and more foaming at the mouth than the next but this was no ordinary prey that they had found this was a man a creature even just then even just like then hungry and angry that seeped from all their pores and fans as wolves and sebastian alike he was not what they anticipated, and when one of the three wolves finally lunged at Sebastian to rip the flesh shot from his arm, he grabbed it by the neck, fell to his knees, 
with the wolf biting and snapping at him in the fog, Sebastian opened his mouth, revealing his own fangs, and hissed and bit down on the wolf, piercing its warm skin, allowing its blood to seep into Sebastian's thirsty mouth. The wolf yelped in pain and fear, mostly fear, and died in Sebastian's clutches. The other two wolves stopped in their tracks, watching the merciless death of their pack leader. Then they walked up to Sebastian, their tails between their legs, and licked the blood off his face. And in those moments, as the sun began to rise, all Sebastian wanted to do was to be back in his safe place of Lockwood Thicket. More wolves began coming out of the shade of surrounded trees. They all seemed to tote to Sebastian knowing he was the dominant force in the forest now that and the entire pack of wolves accompanied Sebastian back to Lockwood Thicket their new leader the human the village would soon fear more than the bite of a wolf light from the cool afternoon sun entered the main parlor of Taramore House through a slightly pulled draped and hung on either side of a large window that looked out on the to a garden that was personally designed by Rebecca Lord herself. In the parlor, Rebecca eagerly awaited a personal guest she had summoned to the mansion. To the point she had even sent Hampstead down to the village to drive the person up to the house himself. Rebecca was done playing games, and she was about to set off a string of events that would on time lead to what she hoped would be the end of Eliza Good's meddling in her family once and for all. As the family, Rebecca, Rebecca her maid Georgina, Jacob in his chair, Evie reading a book, Celeste and Charlotte all set in various states of pre-dinner entertainment in the parlor, some reading by gas lamp. Or like Rebecca fiddling with her knitting, the sound of footsteps could be heard coming down the marble hallway towards the parlor. Rebecca stood up from her plush sofa and dropped the knitting on the cushion beside her. Jacob looked up from his book and furrowed his brow unsure of what was happening, and Hampstead entered with Constable Gregor Rains with his deputy Philip Braga. The constable, madam. Hempstead announced after doing his duty in bringing in the head of the island's law enforcement. Mrs. Lord, Gregory said, greeting Rebecca with a head bow. Mr. Lord, he greeted Jacob, what was so important that you needed to have me chauffeured all the way up here in such a forceful way. It was as if Mr. Hampstead himself were the constable. Mother, what's going on? Jacob asked, dropping the newspaper in his lap. I apologize if there was any inconvenience, constable, but I want to give us a personal update on Christian Evans' murder and my son's attempt at murder. We haven't heard anything yet, Rebecca said. As you know, Mrs. Lord, with Mr. Lord's memory being so fragmented of the night and no witnesses, I've had a difficult time pinning the crime on one person, but I am definitely getting there, Gregory said without mentioning Celeste's name, the person who he was most sure did it. That's what I suspected, Rebecca replied. Mother, why would you call the constable over here for this? He said he should be able to do his job, and I will gladly do what I can do to help as soon as I begin remembering what happened. It seems a bit out of the ordinary, and perhaps a bit strange to interfere this way, Jacob said, still faking his amnesia. Evie, Celeste, Georgina, and Charlotte all looked at each other, feeling out of place. Philip looked over at Celeste and smiled. She smiled back and covered her growing baby stomach to shed it from other people's eyes. The constable may not need your memory back. I know who did this, you... And to Christian, Rebecca said, shaking the room, or sorry, shocking the room. What do you mean, you know, Ma, Rant, ma'am, Rain's question as he and Rebecca both look, took a seat in the luxurious furniture in the Lord family parlor opposite each other. 
I have it on good authority that the person you're searching for, the person who has done this to my son, to that poor boy Christian Evans is a woman who's had it out for this family for a long time. This crime was aimed at my son, but was meant to hurt me. Christian was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. The shooter is Eliza Good. She's the one who did this. She and her daughter, Mary, who, if you recall, shot Sebastian, have wanted this family in their graves for decades. It's her that you need to arrest. It's her that needs to rot in a jail cell for the rest of her life. Her daughter may have escaped justice by choosing death, but her mother should not get away so easily. You should arrest her today, Rebecca announced once again, sh shocking the room in a fever of fervor of talk. Questions came at Rebecca from left and right, confusion and shock world and noise in the air. Charlotte began to tear up knowing Eliza was her grandmother. My God, those women, Celeste, said to Rain's surprise as he had been waiting to trap Celeste as the culprit. Mrs. Lord, are you sure? Evie asked in disbelief. How? How Jacob wondered in sincere confusion on how his mother could know. What evidence do you have, Reigns asked, attempting to make a solid case, still believing his hunch that Celeste had done the shooting, was the true criminal and had been waiting for Philippe to help trap her. It's obvious Mary shot Sebastian, Eliza shot Jacob and Christian. Yeah, I won't say nothing. This is a chain of crimes that I believe was not was to have again and ended at Sebastian and Evie's wedding. I believe this was the ultimate plot to have us killed, all killed one by one, Rebecca said her lie, burning the tip of her tongue. Yet the irony was she was actually unknowingly correct. We would need something substantial to make an arrest, Philip added happily. That it, Rebecca accused someone that wasn't Sless, as Reigns had suspected. Rebecca had no idea who really shot Jacob. Her accusation was purely an attempting to use her power to jail Eliza for what she did all those years ago when Rebecca's child died. This was an attempt to prove the justice system to have an innocent person arrested and accused of a horrible crime. And it was actually accurate, but no one knew that, not even Rebecca. Georgina's stomach began became as tight as the sailor's knot. Her mother Eliza was now in danger, and all she could do was sit there and pretend to be as shocked and angry as the others. Rebecca was determined to have the woman captured off her island, and brought to justice, see when Jacob, who had truly no idea what was happening, felt confused by his mother's sudden wade into the waters of criminal justice, where she did, where she had no place being. Miss Lord, I assure you, if you had proof, I would head over to, to Good Island and make sure she had take what well, she was taken in, and, and taken care of. But there is no proof of this. We have no proof, Rain said. Go, go to her house, and there, and I'm sure you'll find something that will convince you that my hunch is correct. Couldn't you at least go there and arrest her for aiding and abetting her daughter Mary's escape? The woman got away with Sebastian's murder, exclaimed. But Sebastian wasn't murdered, Rain's replied, confused. That's correct, Philip added, motioning over to Evie with his eyes. What Rebecca said, losing her own place in the story. That's right, he wasn't, Evie replied, shooting Rebecca a talk to remind of her of their story about Sebastian's disappearance and return. Your own publication said that someone kidnapped Sebastian and replaced him with some lookalike person in an effort to steal the for family fortune. The paper said the lookalike was the one Killed, not Sebastian, Reigns added. Jacob, Evie, and Rebecca looked at each other and paused. Jacob did remember Sebastian and his return and the story Rebecca had concocted about his miraculous survival. He knew the truth about his nephew's affliction. What was most important was that he also knew he was the one behind Sebastian's shooting and attempted murder. He was. 
That's what she means, surely. Isn't that right, Mrs. Lord? Go on, explain, Evie said, feeling unsure with the entire situation. This is all going out of control, Jacob said, attempting to call the room. Mother, you don't know what you're talking about. No, she doesn't, Georgina said, surprised in the room with her outburst. It wasn't Eliza Good who did this to Mr. Lord and Mr. Evans. I know who did. I know who did this, and I have to fi I have to finally tell the truth, she added to everyone's shock and gasp. Georgina, what are you going, Rebecca asked, of her personal maid unaware of her knowing anything about the crime. But Georgina felt trapped. She was actually Mary living in another woman's body, and Mary didn't want her mother, Eliza, to go to prison. She didn't know what Rebecca thought she knew. She had no clue of that. But what she did know was that Rebecca didn't have the proof Constable Evans needed. If he did go to Good Island, he was sure to find the gun. Mary and Georgina's body had to think fast to protect her mother and thus herself. It was Georgina said, pausing, unable to think for a split second, then out of the corner of her eyes she saw Celeste. It was her. What? Celeste shouted, standing straight up from her chair. What are you talking about? Philip panicked. Georgina? No, A.B. shouted. That's impossible, Philip added to Rain's annoyance. Georgina, her mind racing to protect Eliza, finger pointed the person she could think of, and although that had no real proof either, she had something else on her side. A better lie that Rebecca's. I saw her leaving the mansion the night of the shooting. She was angered. She was upset, and she had a, a re reason to shoot Mr. Lord. Ask her. Ask her, Georgina said, her words swirling together and coming out of in fast motions. That is a lie, Celeste shouted back. Daddy, Charlotte said, running to her father's side. Miss Kent, do you have proof of this yourself, Reigns asked, hoping. She did as he, this helped his case about Celeste. So she had a gun, Georgina said, lying. I have never had a gun in my whole life. This is outrageous. This never happened, Celeste said. Detective Reigns, this is all preposterous, Georgina's proof. It's just as lacking as Mrs. Lord's proof. We're basically at the exact same place as we were at the beginning of all this. No one knows who did it. No one. Evie said, attempting to set everyone straight. You were leaving the mansion that night. Late day. There was something in your hand. You were angry, Georgina began again, ignoring Evie. And just before Rain slowly pulled out his handcuffs, I leave the mansion every night. I go home. I was. I always go home, Celeste said to Rain's suspicion. Constable Rain's had suspected Celeste the whole time. He knew there was something about her and had suspected that her word, that the secrets of her own family would cause trouble for her, was the motive. She wanted to keep her half-siblings paternally a secret, and Jacob was blackmailing her with the information. Rain's knew this. He had know this for a long time and was just days away from connecting the dots but now georgina's supposed eyewitness for her leaving with a gun that night was perfect for his case where's the gun now miss davini reigns asked stoically i have no gun the woman is lying celeste shouted back celeste would not hurt daddy charlotte said but i saw it georgina said are you sure you're absolutely sure celeste is who you saw, Philip asked. Becca's eyes were spinning. She had set off a strange set of accusations that she did not anticipate. She felt sick to her stomach, watching Celeste suddenly become the one in Rain's crosshairs. This wasn't what she had planned. She wanted her words to be used against Eliza. Eliza was the one she wanted to suffer, not Celeste. It had gone off the rails, and Rebecca could do was sit back on her sofa and watch it crumble all around her. Perhaps we should discuss this in the village, shall we, Rain said, feeding into Georgina's eye, who was hoping she didn't have to resort to using her own set of magic to convince the constable of her tale. Jacob knew that Celeste was more than capable of doing it, and God knows he had plenty of motive 
motive, but it didn't matter to Jacob. He didn't want her to go to jail regardless. Then as Constable Burns lifted the handcuffs up, well, he was about to lock Celeste's hands, Jacob began to panic. He didn't know who shot him, but he also didn't want the mother of his unborn child to go to jail for something she perhaps didn't do. I am... I'm unwell, Jacob said in his chair. Jacob's eyes rolled to the back of his head and began to shake. His whole body shook into tremors from head to feet. He began to sweat and spit, spit from his mouth. He slumped over and fell onto the floor as Jacob and Georgina screamed and went to, down to the floor to help him up. Jacob, Jacob, Rebecca screamed, slapping his face. Reigns quickly turned back in to Jacob on the floor and helped roll over, roll him over. They poured cold water on, from a pitcher on a side table on his face and the tremor stopped. Mr. Lord, Rain said, attempting to gain Jacob's attention away from the seizure. Yeah, those are vicious to have, by the way. <clears throat> uh, turn him over. Turn him over now, Philip said, helping. Jacob opened his eyes. His hands were cold and sweaty. They helped him back up to the chair he was in and looked the, around the room once again, or sorry, once saw his mother and her maid, Georgina, who didn't, who he didn't know was actually his ex Mary in a new body. On the other, his daughter, Celeste, clinging to his, her governor, Celeste Davini, a woman who he was so madly in love with, who was carrying his child. Reigns was in the center of the room staring at him. Jacob opened his eyes. His hands were cold and sweaty. They helped him back up to the chair. He was in and out, looked around the room, one side, his mother and her maid Georgina, who he did. I got right up on sorry. Mr. Lord. Reigns asked again as the light of the gas lamp flickered on their face. Should I call Dr. Ward? Ham said, asked, stepping back into the room after hearing all the commotion. I remember, Jacob said suddenly to a hush room. I know who shot Christian and I. I know, Jacob said. Who? Who did it, Reigns? Asked, eager to finally get the truth. Was it Celeste? Was it, was it Eliza or Rebecca? Asked him, hoping her lie would come true. Then Jacob fresh off his seizure that he faked just like he had faked his amnesia, looked at his mother and snarled at her. Becca tilted her head to the side. Her body became tight, feeling strange, receiving that look from Jacob. What is it, Jacob Reigns asked, no noting the strange look in Jacob's eye to his mother. It was her. It was my mother, Rebecca. The room again gasped. Jacob, Evie. Cast, you're mistaken. Are you sure? Reigns asked. Just as shocked as everyone else, Jacob, what are you doing? What are you saying? Rebecca asked in panic. I remember it like it was yesterday. I have no doubt in my mind that it was her. I saw her face in the shadows, and I know it was her, Jacob said, lying. Lying to protect Sless, who was beginning to believe who he was beginning to believe was the culprit. Liar, Rebecca shouted just before she leaned over, whipped her arm back across her chest and lapping her arm back, slapping across, Jacob across the face with the back of her hand, her wedding ring scarring the side of his face in the process. Grandma, Grandma sorrow screamed as Celeste held her back. Come with me, Miss Lord Green said, grabbing Rebecca by the Let go. Let me go. This is all a lie. He's lying, Rebecca said, finally telling the truth. Her own plan, blaming someone else for the crime, blowing up in her face. Philip pulled Rebecca out of the room and out of the sight, leaving the others in shock. You can all say nothing. Nothing at all. Let us investigate and interrogate her and make sure everything lines up. No word will come from my office until then, agreed Rain's order as anyone nodded in agreement before he left to follow Philip out of the room with their suspect. I don't know what to say, Celeste, as they all sh took a breath. You're innocent. That's all that matters, Jacob replied. Now justice will be settled.
Will it? D.B. asked Jacob. Are you sure your mother did this? She asked. Why would I lie? She's my mother, Jacob replied. Evie squinted, not believing him. She looked over at Celeste, who felt strangely thankful for Jacob's sudden return to memory. Thankful that she was no longer implicated by... But thankful for Jacob for saving her, she was almost felt grateful to him. Georgina can't come. We'll have to let things for Mr. Lord while she's in the village. We cannot allow her to be treated like some common criminal. Evie said, brushing off Jacob's assertion that he did the right thing. But she is, Evie, she, sh she shot me in cold blood and killed your lover Christian. Thank God my memory came back. I remember everything. Even that bit of Christian's being your dirty lover, Jacob snarled. Evie lunged at Jacob and two slapped him across the face. This time, open hand and wide on the opposite cheek, Rebecca had landed on. Whoever did this to you, and I don't believe for one second it was your mother, should have finished the job and left you in the grave yourself. Come, Georgina, Evie said angrily as she and the maid quickly left the, to gather belongings for Rebecca. Jacob then slowly got up from his chair. Aching from the healing gunshot wound, aching from the two slaps in the face, and waddled over to the other sofa where Celeste and Charlotte were huddled together. You're safe, he said to Celeste. You'll both always be safe, he added, placing his hand on her baby bump. The following evening, the fireplace in Evie's private room flickered in the darkness of the room. The curtains were pulled, making the room darker than it actually was outside where the moon was hidden by the thick overcast of the sky it looked like giant mounds of gray cotton floating over the island evie was in a dark dress with gold trim with large purple birds and the fabric picked up base candle stick holder and lopped on one of her lace gloved fingers onto the circle grip and lit the thick white candle so that it brightened her way to the window where she peeped out onto the yard three flowers below then the, uh, the wall on the other side of her room that was painted like a forest of trees slid open then she turned allowing the light of her candle to flow over to where she the wall had separated in there in the shadows of the open passage was Sebastian Ward freshly alive from his death, near-death experience once by Alan Win Winterborn, and a second by the wolves of the forest. Hello, my love, Sebastian said slowly, walking over to his bride and kissed her deeply and passionately on the lips. She blushed and kissed him again, his amber-colored eyes so heavenly to her own gaze she had missed him in the day. When she, the sun was up, a half-lived relationship was such a struggle for her. But she was trying to make the, their relationship work. God knows she was trying, especially now that she suspected she was, like Celeste, pregnant with Sebastian's child, a new heir to the Lord family fortune. Evie, although happy Sebastian was with her again, had terrible news for him. What is it? he asked, her noticing her quick change of mood. I'm afraid dinner has to be cancelled tonight, Sebastian. Something has happened, she replied, mentioning their dinner date at Terramore before sitting herself down on the sofa near the window and the place Sebastian followed her to the sofa, thinking she perhaps knew about the his violent confrontation with her friend Alice the night before. What is it? What ha what's happened? He asked, pretending still not to know. It's Jacob, she replied to his surprise. He's remembered the night he was shot. At least that's what he says. He's named the person who shot him, Sebastian. He's named your grandmother, he explained. My grandmother? She would never. Where is she? Sebastian re replied, leaping to his Feet furious with the news. Sebastian, calm down, please. She's not here. Reigns took her to the village, and I suppose he, she's being questioned. He's been questioning her, Evie replied. Well, 
He did. And now we have to wait until Reigns is done questioning her to clear her. I don't believe him either. But the authorities have to go with the only witness who's living has to say. If he says she did it, they'll have to believe him, Evie said, now standing with Sebastian, his fists were balled up and shaken. If all I do for the rest of my godforsaken life is destroy the man, destroy that man, then it'll be a life well lived. I will crush his body in my bare hands and beat him to a pulp for his lies, for his deceit, for all he's done, for all he's done. Sebastian said, throwing one of his fists into a large frame, painting and blasting it through the wall of Evie's room. Sebastian, she shouted, you can't behave this way, she added. He turned to her. His face had changed again. He was no longer the loving face that stepped through the secret passage just moments ago. It was cold, sullen, and frightening in the shadows it was that were cast by the candlelight. I want his blood. I want his blood, Sebastian brought. No, stop this. Listen to me. This right now, we have to have cooler heads. Jacob is a liar, and I don't believe him for a second. But you cannot go around showing this side of you. She paused before saying something that would anger him. This what, Evie? What were you going to say? This monster? This is what I am now. This is what I am forever. You said you understood. And you would stand by me now. I can sense your doubts is so clear. Your heart rate is up. Your hands shake when you see me. They do not hold me the way they used to, even when we make love. I can tell you hold back, Sebastian said, his mouth sharp hit with teeth, searching to <laughs> get <laughs> a p uh, fl flesh to pierce. I love you, Sebastian. I do. But the way things change you so quickly, the way you flip from the kind of man I fell in love with to the cold person you are now. It is an adjustment, she said, stepping back when we did. She stepped in the back hem of her long, dark dress. She fell backward, and Sebastian, with lightning speed, caught her, and he fell. She was now laying backwards in his arms, his face still cold. His eyes had gone from warm amber pale to gray. She could feel the coldness of his arms locked around her warm body. She went and pushed on his shoulders, and she wanted him to let him to let, let go. You cannot even bear for touch, he said, lifting her from the falling position. Sebastian, we need to focus on your grandmother and making sure this crime is not pinned on her. Jacob cannot be allowed to continue to do the things he's done in the past. We know now his tricks and what he's capable of. We can make sure, Evie said before Sebastian loudly roared over her voice. Enough, she froze in fears. I don't want to talk about him anymore. I don't want anything anymore but you. To hell with this family and their treachery. I only want you. Sebastian said, throwing his arms across the fireplace, mantle ejecting all the knickknacks, photos, and unlit candle and a vase with fresh red roses all the floor of the room. Evie watched as the water from the floor, flower vase sh sh soaked into a carpet. She took a deep breath and carefully walked over to the mess Sebastian had made. Her back was to him. She was breathing hard. The light of the fireplace in front of him warmed his cold body, his mouth still showing his fins. Where are you going? Do not turn your back on me, Evangeline, he snared the darkness that Alice had so warned her about showing up in spades. Evie turned her back. She was crying. She was shaking. His anger, his dark nature was becoming more and more overpowering. She could see there was something out of control about Sebastian, something she could not heal, something she could not fix, something she could not love anyway. It was everything Alice, her, her friend, had told her would happen. Alice, so deep in her powers, was right, and Evie was seeing Sebastian's shadowy vampire side coming out more and more. Her tears fell over her peach-toned cheeks. She only shook her head 
and opened the door to her private room and made her way out, turning down the red carpet hallway past Georgina, who was coming to see her. Amy, Georgina shouted, trying to stop her in the hall with no success. Georgina then entered the room and found Sebastian leaving, leaning over the fireplace, surrounded by the mess his anger had made. What have you done? she asked her cousin Sebastian. Leave me alone, Mary, he said, using her real name. Did you hurt Evie? She asked, stepping over the roses in her pink dress, whose fabric was ironically covered in pink roses. Perhaps her feelings, Sebastian said under his breath. What's this of my grandmother shooting Jacob? You, your powers aren't as strong as your mother's. But you can still see the truth of what happened, can't you? Is it true? Did she try to kill him and kill Chris Christian, he said. I didn't see those types of things, but I could be. Tr it could be true that she did it, Georgina said, lying as she knew her own mother had sent her spirit to kill Jacob. This is what happens when you don't send the shadow. Um, <laughs> people end up alive. No, I'm picking. Are you sure, Sebastian said, squinting her sus suspectedly, his own truth detector working over time. We don't have time to discuss this. You need to leave, Terramore, and I would suggest not returning until this matter is sorted out. She warned. Why? It's Jacob, I fear his memory returned. We have a lot more to fear than just accusations of murder. You could be on the chopping block next. He tried to... He's tried before. He could try again, she said. As everyone keeps reminding me, Mary, I am not the same person I was when Jacob convinced you to shoot me. He said as she lifted a brow, somewhat embarrassed of that memory. Jacob cannot hurt me, he added. Nevertheless, your own temper will clearly be your own downfall. Look at this room. Look at this mess you've made. You're, you'll only create more of a problem when and lose Evangeline forever. Is that what you want, Sebastian? Is that what my mother gave up so much for so you could come back to life? This is the type of man your mother would be... This is not the type of man your mother would be proud of, Georgina said, her words hitting Sebastian over and over again, one after the other and more painful than the next. No other word hurt him more than when she mentioned his dead mother, Sabrina, it stabbed him. This use, it went into his heart like a flaming hot knife, and it felt Georgina's disappointment in his twist had so called knife deeper and deeper into him with her words. Then again, in furiation, he turned, mouth open, fangs, he lunged at her, screaming at her to never speak of his mother. She gasped at, and lifted her arm in the hair with her had open fingers spread far apart and there in a van Evie's dark room she used her powers for the first time freezing Sebastian in midair with his mouth open showing her the monster her mother made Georgina who at first had her face turned so she could not see what was coming then realized she was unharmed she opened her eyes and turned back to where Sebastian was standing it was like a statue floating in the center of the room, with only his eyes given the ability to move. So circled him looking at the bo body in wonder and surprised that he had accomplished it. Cousin, you need to rein this anger in, she said, sincere, sincerely concerned for him. If you don't, you'll only find the darkness and will take it will take over you completely. I pray that it will have I pray that it'll happen because you need it to happen, and I, you and I are still a team. I will not let that up, but you have to help me, too. Keep your calm. Stay away from Terramore and Jacob. It's the only way we can keep you safe for now, she said. His body, all well, frozen in this state, began to calm. His teeth vanished, his eyes turned back to amber, and his skin warmed to the touch. Georgina said, saw of this happening with her own eyes, and then she snapped her fingers, releasing him from her 
magical grip. I didn't know how. I don't know how, he said softly, almost childlike. You must try, my sweet boy. You must try, she said, caressing her cousin's cheek. He took a breath, feeling exhausted. This is the most recent emotional up and down. Leave me, please. Just leave me with my thoughts. I have to piece together what I will have I will do about Evie. I've hurt her. I frightened her. Please let just go. Let me figure all this all in. He said something down to the floor and attempting to clean up the mess he had made. She nodded that she would leave, and just before he, she did, she turned back around the door and watched him cry while he put the tossed down flowers back in the <coughs> <coughs> their waterless vase. But she felt pity on him. It was a man trapped between his lost life of a normal person and this creature her mother created to bring him back from beyond the grave, she could see the tor torment he was under as the constant battle between the good of his heart and the evil of his mind at war deep inside of him. Evie was seeing it too. It was so powerful and seeping out into his relationships. All Georgina could do was allow him to literally and figuratively pick up the pieces of his damaged world. Georgina walked away from the room Sebastian was left in and quietly made her way back down the hall towards her own apartments. As she, she did, to, so Nicholas Jordan, Evie's brother, was sneaking around the shadows past the open door where Sebastian was. He saw his brother-in-law on his knees cleaning up the mess, and then Nick made his way towards the mouth of the top of the stairs that led down three floors to the marble foyer below. Nick, too, had things to do that night. He was sneaking out of, with Albert's journal and headed to see all the Winterborn siblings with news of what he had found. At this, or sorry, at his small apartment in the village, Matthew Winterborn struggled to keep his nerves in check. He was thinking about E.B. Jordan Lord. He couldn't get his mind off of the beautiful woman and how much his instincts would wanted to protect her. And not just from Sebastian, but also from his own sister's strange obsession and ridding the world of Sebastian. One thing was sure, Matthew, Evie, was the victim in all the swirling darkness on the island. And he would do anything to keep her innocent life safe even if it meant helping his sister do the unthinkable and take someone's life, Sebastian's. Matthew existed, exited his ba bedroom and found Alice quietly sitting in the front of the room on a chair reading from her favorite book. She looked like a painting in the chair, in the chair and the reflection of the dim candlelit all around her. Eight of them in all, the various plants plotted around the apartment created an ambience of freshness that added to Alice's pain like atmosphere. Could we talk? he asked his sister. What is it? she asked, sensing the concern in his voice. I wanted to know your plan. I want to help. I think with my help you'll be successful and I can make sure that you're safe. I wouldn't want you to hurt in the aftermath of this, Matthew said, sitting across from her. Help me, she asked, confusing, confused. Forget she had told Matthew what she wanted to do about Sebastian. Yes, about eating Sebastian. If I can help, I will do. Uh, or sorry, I don't want anyone to get hurt, anyone else to get hurt. Not by him, and it's important that we need to work on this together, he said. Oh, sweet Matthew, I know how pure of heart, pure your heart is. But you need not to worry about Sebastian anymore, Evie either. She's free, we're, we're all free. And now that Sebastian's out of the way, all the evil that he is surrounded on this island, and its people will slowly litten, 
Lighton, she answered, pain, patting his knee. Matthew looked at Alice. Confused, he had no idea what she meant. How could Sebastian now not be a threat to them? But before he could get her clarification, a night air brought along an unexpected visitor who was knocking at their apartment door. Matthew and Alice looked at each other, unsure of who it could be. Matthew's first thought was Philip. Perhaps he had some news on Jacob slash Christian's case that Matthew had been helping with. Matthew got up from his chair and went to the door. It was not Philip. It was Nicholas, fresh from his quick rush out of Terramore House. He was out of breath. He had run from the taxi that brought him to the apartment. He pushed his way in. Frightened, he was followed. His nervous energy frightened Alice and Matthew to the point they also felt it was someone, as if someone was following him. Jesus, man, Matthew shouted as Nick rushed to the center of the room. What is it? This. Look at this. I found what this island has been hiding. I finally found it. And it's horrible. I had to show you. This could be the beginning of the end of all the horrible evil here. What is it, Matthew, said Nick, handed him the journal. Albert Lord's journal, actually. It's a journal Albert and several of his ancestors had been keeping it for generations. Of, if documents the horrible things he and the other families did when they first settled here from England and Wales, Nick explained before turning to Alice if the details what happened to your people, he added sadly. Matthew flipped through the papers, reading sporadically. It burned his soft heart to see the horrible notes from the Lord men about the murders of the Welshport people, Winterborn's people, the tribe of natives that lived on the Welshport first, deaths, stolen land, murders, all of it right here in their, in their own handwriting. This is disgusting, Matthew said. It's as if they were happy with what they did. It's the first and possible key piece to this puzzle, Nick said. We already knew, Al said, shocking Nick, as he turned to Matthew, who nodded his head. You both knew about these people? These people were responsible for such atrocities to your people, even before you were both were born? Nick asked, confused. Of course, these are our stories. These are our people. We know every last horrible detail. And how these sellers came, to, came, killed, and took from us, Alice Nevitt. Their evil is the source of the curse. The curse placed on all who dwelled here, especially the remaining lords, she added. Here's Math here, Matthew said, showing Nick the last entry by Albert Lord, the family he burned alive. This is our family, the two children Albert writes about he could not find after the fire went out. That is Alice and myself. We escaped. I was very little and Alice was just a baby. I took her. I escaped with her and watched from a hillside as our home and family burned in the darkest red flames I had ever seen and ever seen since. Matthew explained. I'm so sorry, Nick, said grabbing Alice's hand and squeezing. He pulled her in and hugged her tightly. His love for her only grew stronger in that moment. While on their tight embrace, Alice dropped the bomb, but we don't have to worry about so much anymore. The apex of this curse has been destroyed. It's dead. Matthew and Nick looked at each other confused. What are you saying, Matthew? Asked. Dead, Nick asked too. Who's dead? It's gone. Neutralized. I did it. I killed Sebastian last night. And we'll all be safe as soon as the universe sense the monster. The creature of the night is no more. Then our ancestor will begin the healing process for us all. He is the final male heir of the Lord. And now that he's dead and Jacob has no male children, we'll finally see justice for us all. Jacob will not live forever, and we can finally be free of these Lord men, Alice exclaimed. Alice, he could, how could you do this on your own? You could have 
been killed, Matthew shouted, taking his place as her concerned older brother. She shrugged, proud that she what she had done. What are you talking about? Sebastian isn't dead, Nick replied. Matthew turned, his brow furrowed. He's dead. I drowned him. I watched him drown in the sea, Alice said assertively. He's gone, Alice repeated. No, no, he's not. I just saw him when I left Terramore. He came to see Evie for dinner. He's alive, Alice. He's alive, Nick confirmed, shocking her. It didn't work. How did he escape? I did everything to make sure he stayed below the sea and watched him drown. Alice shouted her heart into her stomach with the truth of her failure. I don't know, Nick said, but we all, we still have time. If you really want to do this, if you really want to take back the world your ancestors were killed over, I will help. I will do everything to help this woman, he added. Sebastian must, must die, Matthew said. Alice nodded her head. Once little tear fell from our brown eyes, upset that she had not saved everyone like she had thought she did. He was to be destroyed, but finally set the universe, of course, for the right. If not, we could all be killed. His darkness and evil will only get stronger, overshadowing who he once was. We have to kill him once and for all, Alice said. Then we're agreed. The three of us. I don't. Then we're agreed. The three of us will do it. We will end him, Matthew said out loud. The other two nodded their heads in agreement. Then let Let's plan this right. As the three began to plot their murder of the monster, Nick began to feel pain in his in his heart. He was feeling guilt, guilt for doing this against his own sister. He loved Evie so much. And plotting to kill her husband felt like a betrayal that he may not be able to come back from. But he had to. He had to do it with Alice and Matthew to save them all. I, I gotta have a talk with Nick here. I don't think this should be the price for sex. <laughs> I'm kidding. Oh, uh, goodness. Um, Eliza reads her tea leaves. <laughs> be careful with that. On Good Island, the sun began to rise, peaking a, a bit... Peaking a bit of much welcome warmth into the closed shutters of Eliza Good's small cabin. She sat on a rocking chair alone in the front room as the fireplace smoldered in the earth into a heap of smoke. She had not slept, not a wink. She only sat in the rocking chair with thoughts of what was to come. She could feel danger in the horizon. She could feel the grip of something truly terrifying coming. Was it coming towards her? Was it towards her daughter? Was she finally have to sad, settle, settle herself into the truth of what she was and finally use her own powers unapologetically? She had yet to truly use her gifts to their full capacity. She feared doing so. She feared the outcome, the reproduction of using the powers. What you give in power comes back in pain, she told herself in her mind. What you give in power comes back in pain. This is what she feared. She should unleash her full powers. She'd receive in pain right back to her. Magic in her case was it a give and take. Eliza, drowsy yet restless, walked into her kitchen at the sound of the tea kettle. Steaming its well siren, she grabbed the hot kettle round its round base and not only by the safer handle option the burning sensation on the palms of her hands sizzling while she then tipped the kettle over into a small cup and saucer her burns and blistering and peeling suddenly healed she looked into the swirling hot tea and removed the pouch from inside the pocket of her white dress the pouch was brown made it 
made of burlap and had a tight red thread that when cinched closed the pouch up tightly. She unleashed the red thread and forked the small flakes of red leaves that fell into the boiling water. The leaves soon began to evaporate into the a f red thicket liquid blood. The blood from the leaves swirled around and became darker and darker red as the water became absorbed onto the herbs. Eliza placed a spoon in the tea and stirred in tea thicket and dark red, then turned into a golden color, gold like tea should be. The steam swam up into the air, the rim of the cup saucer with her hands, Eliza began to lift the steam higher and higher onto the air. She swirled in the steam with her hands. Shapes began to form, shapes that soon she would see as the future she thought. The steam showed faces, many faces, angry, hostile, bloodthirsty. They were in a large group. They were filled with fire in their eyes. They wanted to end someone's life. They wanted to capture someone. She saw a noose. A pre ready a prayer ready to burn. Their faces were fright with the pain of generations of suffering from an unknown source of what they assumed was bad luck, but was a true truth was truly a curse. A curse so rooted in darkness that it could clouded all their minds from common sense. The faces in the steam were ready to end this curse, and then the steam changed from many faces to just one. Her face, Eliza gasped and splattered into the steam, vanquishing the terrible image of her face. Then she realized her days may be numbered. So, Eliza's in danger. <laughs> I, I, I'll say this. I think because already uh, Rebecca has an alibi for when she was. Um... I do think a lot of crazy stuff's going to happen. I, I, that was really, 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 really good. Book 3, Chapter 7, Accusations of Apparitions. Link's going to be in the description box, guys. Go check it out.